Hi, everybody. I am Courtney Porter. I'm a physical therapist at the Kennedy Career Institute. Um, we heard a few weeks ago about the inpatient physical therapy and occupational therapy. And today we're just going to discuss a little bit more after that acute phase. What does that look like? Uh, so my objectives today are to define ABRT and to include some considerations specifically for patients with AFM, to describe some functional outcomes that we have seen, and to discuss a case study. Activity-based restorative therapy, or ABRT, is defined by repeated near-normal activity, both above and below the level of injury. It's a high-intensity practice of task-specific and pattern activity, and our goal is independence in mobility and in function. There are five key um, principles of ABRT and then three additional interventions that we frequently use. Um, and I'm gonna take the time today to go through each of those. Um, the, each slide is primarily gonna be pictures and videos of different examples. Uh, so the first is functional electrical stimulation or FES. Uh, it's the application of electrical stimulation to a paralyzed muscle. Our goal is regeneration of an activity and it can also assist in decreasing muscle atrophy. Uh, FES is most traditionally seen with use what, what you see in this picture here of the FES ergometers. This is an upper extremity version, but it's also used in combination with other components of ABRT. So in many of the pictures you see today, you'll see electrodes and handheld um, stimulation units. Specifically related to AFM, uh, these patients are do demonstrate a lower motor neuron injury. So you typically want to um, change up your parameters a little bit. You want an increased pulse width and a decreased frequency to allow some of the slower moving motor units to respond with a greater refractory period. Typically our handheld units go to a pulse width of about 400 um, microseconds with some going up to 1000. That being said, these patients also have sensation and that can be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, so you want to remember to go slow and um, build tolerance to this for the kids. Uh, again, just some examples of FES. So on the left-hand side, you'll see a picture here um, of a little boy who got to color his electrodes. We wanna make it as kid-friendly as possible. Um, we frequently call them stickers instead of electrodes. We call it a tickle machine instead of a stim unit, um, just to ease them into this activity as much as possible. The next principle is weight bearing. This is the loading across a joint while promoting proper joint alignment. Um, you're focusing on muscle co-contraction surrounding the joint as well. In the next few slides, I have some examples of both upper and lower extremity weight bearing. Um, so we'll go through those. The, some modifications that you wanna remember, um, as it's been discussed before, these patients often have shoulder and hip subluxes as well as scoliosis. So you wanna be mindful of your positioning. Um, also decreased head control and they are weaker proximally compared to distally, so you often might need to change up how you're doing your positioning and your support. Uh, for standing for weight bearing, there are a couple different options, um, ranging from a more supported, supported standing device to less supportive in the middle, and then also just standing um, with therapist support. This patient has three therapists helping her, one at the front providing help at her knees and her hips, someone uh, providing assistance at the trunk, and then a third staff member um, helping with head control. Um, the picture in the middle, again, just some lower extremity weight bearing of kneeling, um, and then upper extremity weight bearing, you can do sitting activities propped through extended arms. We've added immobilizers to this child's arm just to help him maintain elbow extension. Um, and then for both upper and lower extremity weight bearing, quadruped is a great option. Again, we've added the immobilizers to his arms to help um, and a peanut under his trunk to support him a little bit there. Uh, and then providing assistance at his head because he did have poor head control. And finally, some more upper extremity weight bearing in side lying or in prone. Um, the two bottom prone pictures just showing someone doing a little bit more independently and then how you can provide more support. All right, locomotor training is the retraining of neural patterns during treadmill training. Your focus is on proper gait mechanics, full joint loading, and avoiding compensatory motions or devices. You want to provide sensory cues to retrain neural patterns for effective locomotion, and there are four principles to maximize weight bearing, to optimize sensory cues, to optimize kinematics, and to maximize recovery while minimizing compensation. 
There's three components to an LT session, treadmill training, overground training, and community training. And then this first video here shows a traditional LT session. We have three staff members helping, one back at the hips and then one on each lower extremity providing assistance. And then because these patients often um, have that poor head control or poor proximal strength, we often had to have a fourth staff member um, added in at the head here. Uh, Task-specific practice is the completion of a specific motor task to improve a motor learning. Um, it's important to train a functional task over the impairment, um, and then just make sure that it's relevant to the patient, do lots of repetitions, and then reinforce it with timely feedback. Both of these patients are working on self-feeding skills. Um, the one on the right is um, an OT and a speech therapist doing a co-treat to work on self-feeding. Um, and then more examples, again, self-feeding is a common task. Uh, the patient in the middle is working on rolling and reaching while petting the dog. Uh, and then the patient on the right is working on a standing activity and reaching while playing a video game. And the last example is this patient practicing his sit to stands. So every time he stands up, the car moves. And then when he sits down here, um, the car will stop moving. Um, mass practice is the last principle we'll go through. It's a repetitive task-specific and non-task-specific activities. Um, throughout, you want to promote proper um, kinematics. You want to break down the activity. Um, and when it comes to mass practice, if you think of the theory of constraint-induced movement therapy, you want to remember that you're not making gains because you've stopped using the uninvolved side, but because of your increased use of the involved side. So technology can really be our friend with mass practice with kids um, in order to get a lot in. So this is a patient doing the geo robotic assisted gait training, um, just getting a lot more steps in than he would otherwise be able to get in an overground session. And then this patient here is working on shoulder strengthening. So if you see um, the iPad on top of the screen has a video of, um, it's like a GoPro view of someone skiing and then he is pretending to ski with them. And then those three additional interventions, we use aquatic therapy for a lot of our patients. Uh, you can use basically any of those things that we just talked about, but do them in aquatic setting, um, using buoyancy for assistance um, or the hydrostatic pressure for some resistance. We frequently use vibration plates to help with motor recruitment. Um, and then most importantly is a home rehabilitation rehabilitation program. Uh, as has been said many times, this is a long-term diagnosis and um, incorporating as much into your everyday lives as possible um, is important. So we mentioned some of these throughout, but I just really wanted to discuss some of the considerations for AFM um, positioning as far as hip or shoulder subluxations or scoliosis goes. You want to really remember to promote that proper joint alignment throughout. Um, these patients often do have sensation, so some of the things that we do are uncomfortable. Uh, so going slow and easing them in as much as possible. Uh, we use our behavior psychologists, our therapeutic rec staff, and our child life staff frequently for these patients to help us. Um, and then finally, the anxiety. We have seen our patients with AFM do seem to have a higher level of anxiety than some of our other um, spinal cord injuries. So working really closely with behavior psychology for these patients. And then some of the results that we have seen here. So we retrospectively looked at 29 patients that we saw in our inpatient program from 2014 to 2018. Um, these patients were all seen for at least two weeks of inpatient therapy. They received PT for two to three hours a day. OT for one to two hours, um, speech as needed. Um, and then our team also consists of behavior psychology, social work, child life, therapeutic rec, respiratory therapy as needed, um, nursing, and our medical team. We looked at a few different outcome measures, the first being the SKIM, the spinal cord independence measure. This looks at um, patients' independence in various activities. We looked at the PAMS, which is the Physical Abilities and Mobility Scale. This one is a Kennedy-Krieger developed scale. It's a 20-question 20 20 um, scale that ranks starting with simple activities like tolerance to positioning or being in the wheelchair, um, head control, and then it progresses through higher level activities like stair climbing and standing balance. Uh, the scale goes from 20 to 100 of a possible score. 
And then we looked at WeFIMS in their self-care, mobility, and cognitive domains individually, and then again at their total score. And we did see statistically significant improvements in all of those outcome measures. This is just another view of that improvement that we saw. And then we also looked at manual muscle testing. Uh, as Vince mentioned before, we um, see more strength distally, so in their fingers and their ankles as compared to their shoulders and their hips. We did see that with our patients as well. Um, and we also did see statistically significant improvement from admission to discharge in all of our manual muscle tests. Again, another view of upper extremities is you can see they're stronger in finger flexion extension as compared to shoulder. And then lower extremities stronger at the ankle as compared to the hip, but improvements throughout. We're going to quickly talk about a case study, um, JH. JH is a four-year-old male. He was diagnosed with AFM onset of 10-5-2018. He was two years old at the time. Um, he presented with seven days of a cold um, and then first saw paralysis in his head and neck and then um, progressed through his arms and legs. He is ventilator and G-tube dependent, and he has had three admissions with us at Kennedy Krieger, each about two to four months in length. Some of the strength changes that we saw with him in his first admission, uh, his right upper extremity was a zero out of five on manual muscle testing, and his left upper extremity, he only showed um, one out of five finger flexion, otherwise was zero out of five throughout. His lower extremities, his right was a little bit stronger than his left uh, with primarily threes out of fives and the left is a two minuses. And his most recent um, admission, still that right upper extremity was zero out of five manual muscle testing. Uh, but on his left side, he had gained um, more strength in his grip as well as his wrist flexion and extension at about a three out of five. Um, otherwise he was zero out of five at his elbow and his shoulder. And again, right lower extremity is still showing stronger than the left, um, but improvements had been made. His sitting balance on his first admission, he was dependent at his trunk and head, as can be seen in the picture on the left. Uh, by his second admission, with dependent support of his trunk, he was able to hold his head uh, for brief periods of time. And then on his most recent admission, he was sitting with support at his trunk, um, but then able to briefly hold his head up. In this video here, you can see he's got supported his trunk in his arms, but is independently holding his, uh, his head up. Uh, he's blowing bubbles with the exhale on his ventilator and then using his leg to pop them. So it's a pretty dynamic activity to hold his head. And then today, um, he is doing teletherapy. So his therapist shared this with me, uh, but he is sitting in his bed without any um, head or trunk support at all for brief periods of time. For standing activities, his first admission, he required dependent assistance of two people to stand, or he was primarily standing in a supported standing frame. Most recently, he still required dependent assistance at his head, but was able to stand with minimal to moderate assistance at his hips and lower extremities. Um, he was able to stand without support at his head for brief periods with a little more assist at his trunk, um, which is seen in this video here. And then finally, we just looked at his PAMS scores, which is that um, physical abilities and mobilities scale. Uh, a possible range of scores is from 20 to 100. So you'll see at his very first admission, he scored 20. He scored the lowest score possible. Um, he improved to 38 during that admission. By the time he admitted the second time, he had declined a little bit to a 28. But during that admission, went to 44. Again, in his third admission, we saw a small decline, um, but then an increase again to 48. So some good progress there on his PAM score. Um, so thank you for being here today. Um, also to the therapy team at Kennedy Krieger for helping collect all this data. Um, and we, there's my email too, if you have any questions. And we will now move in to uh, Mahin Jane and Christina Sadowski, who will be talking about managing low bone middle density in AF.